And welcome to the Vonnie Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane Rayo 2 coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, to learn more about this burgeoning parallel network, uh, it's definitely under construction, um, just visit Pasnia, P-A-Z-N-I-A dot com. Uh, joining me is my uh, returning co-host, uh, Kyle Ridden. Um, welcome back, brother. Uh, how's, uh, how's the week been? Busy and hectic, mainly. Um, I was basically working my multiple jobs and so spending a lot more time on import-export, and in this case, it'd be a lot more on the import side of it. So, and again, this was this was more like not every week is like this. It's sort of like with farming or or, or similar types of work where you have your harvest season, right? Short period, but where you're pretty busy and intense. Uh, you know, and all that. And so I was basically having my monthly version of uh, Harvest, essentially. So mm-hmm. but I sound a little drained or sound a little hoarse in my voice. You know, it's like, hey, you know, it's like how many suspects did I have to yell at kind of thing. Um, <laughs> but other than that, um, yeah, everything's been relatively good on my part. Just you're hearing me on the tail end of essentially the monthly Harvest, mm-hmm. uh, so to speak. And so, yeah, I'm just, this is actually the first uh, morning I've woken up since, or excuse me, should say afternoon, because <laughs> I did an overnight uh, two in a row, actually. Um, and it was just like, I don't know. Uh, they, they were, it wasn't that anything has that substantively changed. It's more that it was like running a marathon in some ways. Um, the, the sleepiness, and the uh, and lack of caffeine really was really kind of taking a toll on me. And I sometimes have to remind myself that I'm not 19 anymore. You know, I just mm-hmm. can't put so freaking hard. Whereas, like, some people phrase it, the whole work hard, play hard thing. I can't do that anymore. Or even if I do, it has to be for very, very short periods. So, you know, other than that, I'm, I'm doing mostly okay. Right. Yeah, no, I get you, man. I get you. Um, I guess yeah, that's, that's kind of how the past the past uh, I guess three or four days have been. I've been cleaning out the big shed, which has been a little little laborious. And as I was mentioning to you in pre-show, I um, had to track down a spot where Elaine was getting out. So I had to uh, wrestle 150, 140, 150 full-size male lamb three times uh, in the span of like 24 hours. And the first time was the worst because I had to dive into a bunch of poison ivy and thorn bushes to to do it. So. Um, but it worked, you know, it got him back in and I think it's, it's resolved. So it's behind us, I think, I guess, uh, behind me and I guess your, your stretch is behind you too, at least, um, it sounds like. So that's, uh, yeah. that's, that's good well, to hear. I mean, if you're, if you're, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're like, you know, manhandling livestock, I guess that makes you a cowboy, I suppose. Um, <laughs> but with a dog leash. Yeah. yeah. And a dog collar. Yeah. Something like, yeah. Something like that with, um, you know, so if you're like manhandling livestock and I'm engaging in multiple foot pursuits with, with various suspects, it's just like, I don't know if um, people with a more spiritual bent would, would necessarily say about something like the plant, planet aligning or misaligning or something else, but you know, some type of stuff ha- ha- you know, ha- uh, happens randomly. You know, co- there is such a thing as coincidence, at least to some degree, um, because if you think about it like this way, you know, there's like, what, a couple billion people on the planet, something like that. So there's a lot of activity just in terms of daily survival. Remind anything actually truly unique or exciting or interesting or any of the actual emergency nature, just, just the normal activities uh, that are related to survival of daily life. There is a lot of activity happening. And then you multiply that by the number of people out on the planet, and you multiply that by you see, and then it kind of almost like exponential curve in, in some ways and all that. So what I'm trying to say is this. Um, there's a lot of things happening. You know, it's not like the, the movie that came out yet. Everything, everywhere, all at once in some ways. So people trying to say that, oh, like everything happens for a purpose. And I was like, well, yeah, sometimes, maybe. I mean, maybe there is such a thing as synchronicity, but you know what? If a dude on the, on the African continent and a dude on the Australian continent and someone else on a different continent all start choking on a pretzel, 
kind of like George W. Bush did back in the day. Um, and they all struck on the pretzel at the same time. That does not necessarily mean that the stars align or misaligned so that they start choking on a pretzel. Maybe they choked on a pretzel because they didn't, like, you know, drink water right beforehand and their throats were a little dry and they didn't chew thoroughly. And then that way there would be a coincidence caused by, you know, similar circumstances. So therefore, if you want to not choke on a pretzel, it's kind of like a combination of, you know, drink some water before, during, and after, chew your food thoroughly, and chances are you won't choke on it. That does not, therefore, mean oh, there was some sort of alignment planet thing, and, you know, because you're a Ca- uh, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aries, Pisces, hybrid, you know, astrological sign, therefore you're going to chug on a pretzel today. You know, sometimes things happen because you're, you know, being stupid. Or sometimes you're going to go the other way. Sometimes good things happen because, you know, you have a brain, you filter your water correctly or something, right? So... <laughs> I hope that makes sense to everybody. Sometimes some things happen at the same time just because the human involved is doing something similar. So. Fair enough, man. Fair enough. So I guess, uh, yeah, I guess we'll go ahead and get on with it. Um, so today, um, I've titled uh, this episode, Vanu Shelters, Vanu Home Bases Revisited. Uh, and the show notes can be found at vanupodcast.com forward slash 212. Uh, it's been quite some time uh, since Kyle and I have uh, talked about this topic generally, and uh, I know my thoughts uh, have changed on some potentialities, um, and I guess my just my preferences, um, and they've evolved in others. And I'm sure it's uh, the same as the case for him. I mean, it's been like five or six years probably um, since season. Since we talked about mm-hmm. this in season two, so. Um, so yeah, yeah, we'll start with that, and uh, I guess no, will, that'll be it'll be what we'll talk about today. We're we're at a, actually got a, um, a I guess a time it's a little bit of a time crunch. Go for about for about an hour, a little less. Um, and, uh, um, then next week or maybe the following week, we'll go over the great Pazni update because it could kind of be, um, it, it is kind of related here. I guess it's, it's my, um, anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, but, uh, I guess, yeah, let's, let's try to tackle, um, Vani shelters and Vani home bases today. So I guess the, um, I will start with, um, I have the, uh, TVP 25 Vani shelters, from August 22nd, 2017. And I'll just read this real quick uh, for the benefit of the listeners. We'll introduce kind of, uh, you know, what we've already talked about. We're, we're probably not going to talk about too much. Um, I guess last time was was more general, and I guess we'll probably be building upon that today. But um, I wrote back then, uh, an invulnerable, invulnerable Vanu home base or shelter is a crucial first step in pursuing venuance. This home, home base can be permanently or temporarily fixed and could include a polyethylene A-tent, a sailboat, a van, RV, a tiny house, uh, etc., while you're building up your nest egg, you, uh, you'll likely be simultaneously investigating or developing your Vanu shelter, and you may even need to strategi- strategically relocate to do so. Nonetheless, I still can't say, that, say that those two words after five, six years. Oh, well, it'll never happen. Um, nonetheless, the importance of this first step cannot be understated. Uh, what strategy will you be pursuing? Uh, what will your Vanu home base or shelter look like? Uh, where will it be located, or where will they be located? I guess is a better question. Um, how will you implement defense, deterrence, and concealment? Um, these are all important questions to answer, which is what we did back in August of 2017. Um, and today we'll just kind of, uh, um, develop, um, don't really have much of an outline, but I've thought about this, you know, obviously this is what I've thought about consistently for six or, you know, however long it's been. So, um, lots to talk about. Um, I suppose let's start with, um, I, I guess the way I have this broken up is just, uh, van nomadism revisited, pedestrian nomadism, living on a sailboat, Vanu and cities revisited, um, underground shelters, troglodism, sort of shelters. Um, radical and then uh, radical housing, which um, I'll leave that till towards the end because that's less important, at least for right now. Um, but anyway, van, for Van Nomadism Revisited, I remember doing that uh, that series of uh, episodes in season three with I think Jason Booth was, was with me then. Um, I, maybe you were for there for some of those. I don't rec- I don't recall the time the time the timelines, but um, I was I used to be really really in fan of Van uh, you know in favor of Van Nomadism, and I was I was on the path to you know doing that um, or just living out of the car or whatever. Um, but I'm kind of, uh, I don't think that's necessarily safe to do in the States anymore. Um, in the USSA, if you're going to be driving around on like interstates or government roads a lot, um, not safe places to, they weren't safe places to be back then. And <clears throat> I mean, um, especially if you have out of state plates and such that puts you at, you know, higher, that lowers your MTH, um, even more. Cause that's what they're looking for. That's, you know, what they, they look for little bullshit things to, to fuck with you. Um, and I guess beyond that, um, I don't know, like, just, if you just have, if, like, that's, that's all you have is, and I would say that's all you have, but if that's what you have, like, is your van and all your belongings in your van and maybe a storage unit or whatever, um, 
<clears throat> I mean, there's not a, there's there's obviously some opportunities for financial independence, but definitely not as much as if if uh, you have you know some something semi permanent like a homestead or something. Um, so I guess um, that was that's kind of just the I don't really don't have too much else on. Um, I guess the the only other thing on van nomadism is I would consider it um, in somewhere like Mexico. Um, now obviously that comes with its own ri- with its own risks and such, um, you know, the kind of trade offs. But um, I would I would definitely um, you know having having traveled driven to Acapulco um, from Austin. Um, I would consider, um, I wouldn't go to Acapulco. Acapulco is most definitely a police state, but, um, and I have Mexico city, that place is a shithole. Um, and the bloods tried to, ext- the bloods tried to extort us twice within the span of like two city blocks. Um, but, um, so I wouldn't recommend Mexico city, but there are other places. I mean, the, you know, Hens is still there even after, you know, getting shot in Acapulco. Um, he's still, he's, he's, you know, found a woman in, um, central Mexico somewhere. So he's still there Things are things are going good. So I mean, I, I would consider being nomadism in Mexico, but um, then again, now you know, I guess, anyways, that's pretty much all I have on on being nomadism right now. But uh, I guess, what what are your thoughts on on that as a as a as a strategy? I mean, it's, Rayo did mention back in the sixties and seventies that it wasn't a panacea, and you know, he really wasn't too big of a fan of it, which is why he took more radical you know radical steps. But what are your thoughts on being nomadism in twenty twenty four? So it's probably a good time to also bring up mean time to harassment, mm-hmm. MPH. So, regardless of the particular type of annuum, the particular type or set of techniques, the main thing is that you want the highest, in terms of whatever your home base is, or shall we say set of shelters, even if it's more of a network set up, you want to have the highest possible MTH uh, practically achievable, right? Um, Longer MTH is preferable to shorter MTH, right? You want to have 20 years versus five days. Okay, that's that's the time preference here. So, all the um, Ezekian, uh folks who like to pontificate about heterodox heterodox economics, uh, like uh, the Austrian school, know exactly what I'm talking about. The time preference here is actually longer uh, for MTH. Um, nobody, nobody in their right mind wants a short mean time of harassment. You want as long as possible. Um, I mean, obviously, as long as possible. The longest conceivable um, amount of MTH is basically until your uh, preferably natural death, right? You, know, you achieve that invulnerability to coercion, uh, you know, from now until until it's your time to go. That's that's the ideal. That's the goal. At least, it's in this, at least in this very narrowly limited sense. So if that's indeed the goal, then whatever type of method we're talking about, the van nomadism, the sailboating, other, has to be in furtherance of, or, or has to be measured by MTH. Mm-hmm. So that being said, the van nomadism... Well, remember, there was also not just van nomadism, but that kind of a subset of it, which was uh, van nomadism with city squat spots, which right. was kind of it's a variation of it that had its own kind of thing going on, um, especially with that older article and so forth. Well, I, so I, so I, would, I would say, say yeah, for for Vanu and cities, let's leave the this I guess the van nomadism and city squat spots because I have that I do have that down there, um, and that comes with its own complications. I think nowadays, even just like regardless of the van, so maybe just maybe just consider yeah. van nomadism, maybe in like public lands and out west or something like that for this one, not just just kind of I guess, just a thought maybe. Yeah, I mean, and, and no, that that's fair because the practice of doing Vanu and cities is, is kind of different from Vanu in general, yeah. like it's much more complex, thing, but. But to keep this, but to try to keep this limited to uh, van nomadism more generally, I suppose. Um, there's always going to be the issue about the vehicle registration, right? There's always going to be the issue about the so-called public highways. Kind of like when I wrote about the extra constitutional theory several years ago. Um, at least regarding Texas, if you are on a so-called public highway that the state has designated a strip of land covered by concrete legally as, then the bludge are going to go up and down those roads or be sitting in the, or in some sort of median area or other mm-hmm. hiding spot or in a parking lot or whatever, and they're going to be doing that revenue generation hard. Oh, yeah. oh, speaking of which, I got pulled over yet again the other day. Oh, shit. And it was, 
No, I'm fine, but no, I haven't gotten any speed tickets lately. It is the funniest fucking damn thing. I got yet another warning. But, um, kind of like, you know, how important it is to roleplay police interrogations and all that. It's like, it's like okay, I'm going to deal with the bludge again. You know, roll down the window. Uh, there's a certain technique. It's better if you actually see it. But basically, to try and describe it verbally, you take your two hands, uh, palms up, kind of almost in a triangle, and then you put it in the upper left-hand corner of the steering wheel. So when the cop's making his vehicle approach um, along the driver's side, basically the first thing he sees, even before your head and your face, is actually your hands being completely empty. Remember, it's always watch the hands, watch the hands, watch the hands, watch the hands. So what this particular technique does, it's a type of surrender, but it's also a way of, of, showing, the, of, of showing the blood that it's, the body language of it is, hi, I'm not a threat. Here's the proof I'm not a threat. So it's proving your innocence. And then it's just, and then after that point, it's more than an attitude of, you know, yes, officer, and yes, sir, no, sir, and three bags full, and, you know, how high you want me to jump and all that kind of thing. Because at the end of the day, when you're in the middle of a traffic, of a so-called traffic stop, your life is in danger. Let's just full-blown call it what the fuck it is. Your life is in danger during the entirety of a traffic stop. From the moment those red and blues get flipped on and they flip around or zoom up, zoom up on you or whatever, yeah, it's, your life is in danger. And so the question is how do you handle it? Um, you could become a fugitive that day and, you know, knock over trash cans and whatever else. You could uh, do the typical survival society thing and, you know, do a little, you know, uh, verbal uh, back and forth, and then he would just, and a lot of times the cops will just issue a ticket just because you were being a little, you know, giving them some attitude. And it would also show that they ought to win, uh, at least according to them. Or you can do kind of the goal of the whole point of role-playing police interrogations, which is basically just to survive the encounter with as few, shall we say, transaction costs as possible, which is what I do. And so far, I haven't paid one dime in any sort of enforcement action of that nature. And it's not necessarily that I talk my way out of it. I mean, like, yes, I do, but that's not the mentality I go into it with. And, and yes, this is relevant for Ben Nomadism, which is what I'm getting to. It's not that you're talking yourself out of a traffic stop or talking yourself out of a speeding ticket, talking yourself out of dealing with the bludgeon in general. It's more that you're being somewhat honest with the bludge, but also showing them that, hey, look, you know, you know, being very calm, you know, you're not going to get into the intimidation thing, which they're very used to. The whole, the whole thing of officer presence is the very lowest end of the use of force uh, continuum, right? It's by the fact you show up. You're, that's already a use of force, by the way. So the cops already know this, where they just show up. They know they're, they're going to be intimidating people, and they act accordingly. Um, you know, sometimes they're more forceful and sometimes another. Sometimes they'll try to pull the nice cop routine, which is what I had this last traffic stop, which was funny because the, kid, because the kid was actually younger than I am. Um, but the long and the short of it, Shane, is unless you are getting prepared to role play police interrogations, you really shouldn't do van nomads because you will get pulled over inevitably for something. You know, even if it's a non-moving violation, like an issue with the license plate, you know, display thing, which was the, uh, I think it was the traffic stop before last, I think it was. Um, that was the official excuse they were coming up with for, you know, do you know why I pulled you over kind of thing. So, yeah, uh, just to reiterate, just, just for this moment, if you are not comfortable dealing with the bludge directly in a, I don't want to say verbal jujitsu so much, but let's just say speaking their language, if you're not comfortable just talking to the bludge, you really shouldn't be doing van nomadism of any time because you will deal with them sooner or later. They will figure out an excuse. You can be the most perfect uh, so-called driver on the road. Speed limits, turning using the freaking turn signals, you know, you never cut anybody off, blah, 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 blah. You can be perfect, and they will still find a fucking excuse. Yep, for sure. 
So, so preparation meaning opportunity, as, uh, as mom used to say, preparation meaning opportunity, just assume that if you are going to do van nomadism, you will deal with the blush. And that being said, going back to MTH, your mean time harassment, this means that your MTH will, you are expecting your MTH to be essentially be reset to zero, uh, at least in some sense, or at least otherwise it's, it's going to be shorter, right? Um, and in some sense, Van, and if I'm right by saying that with Van Nomad and just expect to deal with the bludge, then, then by definition, because of the nature of the traffic stop, that is the harassment in question that MTH is measuring. Therefore, <laughs> um, you're just assuming your MTH is going to be pretty short, whatever it is. Even if you go, let's say, uh, I went 10 years without a traffic stop. But then again, you only drove like, I don't know, three times or something. You know, it, it, it's like, if you're going to be driving on the roads, you're going to get harassed sooner or later. And not only that, here's the other thing too, ladies and gentlemen. Even if you never ever hypothetically get pulled over, which is very going to be very impressive. Even if you never get pulled over, a lot of times people will change their behavior in anticipation of being potentially pulled over, of potentially having that MTH getting reset, if you will. I've done it too. Absolutely. I will go around the curve going uh, uh, certain speeds or certain ways that are uh, faster than a hypothetical, you know, white sign with black lettering on it that has the word limit on it uh, because I actually know the capabilities of both not only my pickup truck but also like how sharp like the curve is of the road or something but all, and also the road conditions like is it dry, is it wet, you know, so forth. Like, I know what my truck can handle and not handle. I have skidded out. So I also, I know what to do and what not to do. But, you know, if, if, if you're handling yourself and you're, you know, moving from point A to point B, and you're worried potentially that, oh, no, the bludge might be quite literally around the corner, and then you slam on the brakes, or even if you let off the gas a little easy, just so that that needle on the speedometer goes a little bit lower on whatever the arbitrary number is, that by itself is almost, is an anticipation of failure. That's preparing for failure in some sense. And yet pretty much all, all so-called drivers do it. A lot of them do anyway. And that right there is showing that, you know, whether you're in a van or some other type of conveyance on four wheels with an internal combustion engine, um, if you're already altering, like, how you so-called drive just to you know, minimize contact with the blood, it's like, okay, you're, you're preparing for failure. You're already assuming the harassment's going to happen sooner or later. You're just trying to kind of delay the inevitable, you know, maybe tomorrow but not today kind of thing. Right. <clears throat> yeah, no, I'm with you. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, Van, Van Nomads needs to be super attractive to me, but, um, yeah, not, not so much anymore. Um, I guess a slight variation of this, um, and one I've, uh, you know, <clears throat> kind of for for other reasons um kind of uh seeing as you know more appealing than you know obviously driving on government roads um and in some ways the mth would be higher um well especially for pedestrian nomadism but i guess transportation becomes the issue at that point um and there are a lot obviously lots of means you know walking you know we've got legs that we can walk with but um there are some i've, I've uh there's a couple of channels i i now follow on uh, youtube that uh, they do a lot of freight hopping and uh it's very very interesting um I'm not. Yeah, I guess because I'm. I'm kind of. I'm thinking about this a lot, or I, I haven't over the past you know six months off and on. Um, but uh, there's also the prospects of like abandoned ghost towns, which ghost towns have been written about in Vonnie Vonnie literature before. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know. There's there's some interesting possibilities there. I guess more. They're kind of more far out. But um, I obviously I'm, I'm not you know going to be a pedestrian nomad nomad tomorrow or anything like that. That's yeah. That's not really one of my. Um, but as far as, you know, developing a lifestyle, you know, lifestyle, um, potential lifestyle changes for, for nomads, I think it's um, worth looking into, um, you know, worth looking into. And yeah, I mean, it, it, may, it may sound interesting, but um, yeah, the pedestrian nomadism thing um, with the freight hopping, yeah, having a higher MTH than on government roads, you'd be surprised. Um, yeah, you'd definitely be surprised. But I guess that's that's pretty much all I have there. Um, there are lots of ways to do pedestrian nomadism. Um, obviously, there's like the uh, Smoomans or Super Hobos thing where you've got a bunch of, you know, Vanu home bases out in the middle of the woods where um, obviously you got to walk, you know, miles between them. Um, but yeah, I guess what, what are your thoughts on pedestrian nomadism? There's definitely a lot of merit to it. Um, I would say the MTH would be a lot longer 
Um, so that's that's positive. Um, the only the only potential issue, and this there's a relatively low risk of this uh, in certain areas relative to others and all that. But I would say on the whole, you know how many how many of the bloods are going to really deal with people who are on foot? Right. I mean, if they're not willing to deal with the vagrants of downtown Austin and even other places, I don't think they're really going to cause too much of a ruckus with people just walking along the side of the road. Or as long as you don't look like a vagrant right. or a homeless person, yeah, I don't think they'll, they'll really give a shit well, about you. Well, yeah. yeah, but even if you But do, even then, even then, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I get you. Right. The, the only thing they're concerned at that point is, is more along the lines of what the state calls nuisance abatement, right? They're more concerned about... Um, the dudes setting up an encampment right next to a business or even right next to somebody's mortgaged house, shall we say, that has the potential of lowering those property values, which in turn uh, would affect the tax rate, the property tax rate, right? Because <laughs> um, remember, there's always ulterior motives to all of this. Um, that's, that's the kind of thing they're more worried about. You know, if some dude in some back alley you know, uh, decides to kill himself because he OD'd and there's a syringe still in his arm, nobody gives a shit. They really don't. Uh, what they're more concerned about is if people were trying to set up, shall we say, a village of the store, an encampment. And, you know, it's right outside the entrance to some sort of gated community HOA subdivision thing, then, yeah, then they're going to care. They're absolutely going to care. It's, it's bad imagery as they would say. The optics, I hate. I now hate that word, by the way, hmm. not because of what the word originally means, which is like, you know, which originally had to do with a piece of equipment that you put on the rail of your rifle kind of thing. Now it's optics. Now it has this other connotation to it. Um, yeah. that deals with what, the, what the perception. servile society perceives of you. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. When it, the, yeah, when the, when the yeah, venuant thing very, is to not be noticed by society. Yeah. But yeah. That's a very good point you bring up. Actually, that's actually quite good you bring that up because whether it's the van nomadism or the pedestrian uh, nomadism or, or these other forms, yeah, um, some degree of invisibility is actually rather important. And unfortunately, the first realm is obsessed with imagery, right? So they would view, let's say you've got two people. One of them is dressed in a black shirt and a pair of jeans and some sort of footwear and as otherwise looks normal. And then the other dude is dressed in rags or whatever. Um, they would instantly make an assumption that the dude in rags is like, you know, mentally ill and whatever, and that the other dude is whatever and whatever. But here's the thing, especially when you can look at the rates of people with mental health challenges and all that, it would turn out that, you know, maybe actually both of them are freaking crazy people. Appearances can't be deceiving and all that, um, but unfortunately, the first realm uh, makes me kind of like what the word assumption means, right? Making an ass out of you and me. Um, the first realm, the servile society, is very much on, uh, big on that, and it's part of the reason their entire you know culture is basically collapsing in and around them in a lot of ways. Because you can only look, you can only have a civilization like that for so long, right? There's a ticking time clock. And the reason why is you can have the strongest industrial base on the fucking planet. You can have all sorts of alleged safeguards of one kind or another, whether they be of a legislative or more practical nature. You can have the world at your doorstep, and it still won't matter, because ultimately, if your so-called civilization is based on basically on nothing, then nothing is what it will inevitably become in the long run. It will collapse in on itself, much like the so-called Soviet Union did. And that's why you see a lot of people, even if it's just normal people, uh, even in the first round, talk about either consumerism or they talk about, you know, vulture capitalism or, or other similar terms. It's, it's, it's in the best way they know how to express it, where they're trying to describe basically a self-parasitic organism basically eating itself alive. Very much an Ouroboros type situation. And yeah, that's, that's kind of what it is. So when you're looking at mean time to harassment and you're trying to have that as long as possible, you have to keep in mind that, yeah, the perception of people inhabiting the first realm is, 
it's only important to the extent that they believe in it, right? If they're not so obsessed with imagery and so obsessed with how things look and so forth, then, hell, I mean, at that rate, they might be eligible for uh, potential recruitment, if you know what I'm saying, actually. Uh, and then there are people that are a little bit more open-minded than you think there might be that are, they're trying to hide in plain sight and they're also trying to figure out like what to do with themselves. And yeah, a lot of them are kind of, uh, you could say, bohemian hippie types in some ways. Uh, but then at the same time, they're also acting very bougie with their charcuterie boards and whatever else. So there's very much a syncretic blend of, of, of people. And actually, I've been meeting several of them actually in person too. So this isn't just some theoretical thing, people. Like I am part of the reason I've kind of been on the down low in some ways is I'm I'm tr I'm actively trying to find people, and so far, especially this year, has been unusually fruitful. If, if we're talking about like locally and all that. So that being said, how do I say this, Shane? <laughs> The van nomadism, I think, just to kind of close out that particular one and, and combining that with pedestrian nomadism, I think pedestrian nomadism is a higher MTH overall, right? The cops, the bludge, are really looking for people who have just enough money to pay off the speeding ticket. So they make exactly. this assumption if you've got that, a, well, if, if you've got a, a car, movie, then, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It does not matter if it's a crappy Dodge Neon or it's a Jaguar or something in between. Or, as is the case mm -hmm. with us, it would be some sort of, you know, RV type thing, right? Or yeah, if, you, if you can afford that scam right? of gas, you can definitely afford a goddamn speeding ticket or whatever, yeah. That's their mentality, very much so. And that is a lot of assumptions they're making, blah, 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 blah. So, that being said, oh, God, sorry, stretch my back there. I'm feeling a little stiff. I need to stretch more. Um... Yeah, on a different episode, we're going to cover some sort of physical fitness type thing that we need to mention about the stretching. For sure. You don't need a gym membership to stretch. And sometimes, for some people, that's all they need. Me, personally, I need a little bit more than that. But then again, I'm also doing a lot of driving for uh, my current first realm job, a uh, private security job. So, I mean, there's that, too. Actually, sorry, circle back to Van der for a second. Yeah, like if you're driving a lot... Um, you know, you might need to stretch a little bit more. In fact, I, if there's any one thing that's bad about van nomads in some sense, when you, when you have to move from spot to spot to spot, I mean, the distances can either be really, really short or they can be longer or somewhere in between. And you might have to stretch more if you're doing the kind of more medium, there's a long, somewhat longer length. Like if you're going three hours, let's say, let's say hypothetically you're driving three hours a day. If you're doing your van nomads, for whatever reason, you're moving every day. Uh, maybe that's something you like to do or whatever. Eventually, that's going to catch up with you. If hypothetically you're driving three hours every day, for whatever reason, maybe you just want different uh, views or something, right? I mean, people will have wander lots. Like, it happens. You know, you're going to have to stretch more. You know, I haven't cooped up in a you know, friggin' you know, armored car uh, for hours at a crack, and it's not comfortable. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a very specific type of function, but still the uh, same idea, right? If you're driving for hours, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get to you. Um, even if you kind of, you know, hop in and out of the truck or hop in and out, oh yeah, let's go get a burrito kind of thing, right? You know, that's, that's also an occasion to stretch your legs, right? So I, I said all that to say this. Whether it's the classical vandomatism or it's the vandomatism of city squat spots, generally speaking, your MCH is going to be a hell of a lot shorter than it is with pedestrian nomadism because the cops ain't looking for people just waltzing around. And even if they did, by the way, even if they were more like Round Rock TV and they really were going after, truly and genuinely, those, those boys don't play, by the way. They're a, lot like the, uh, they're a lot like the Williamson County Sheriff's deputies. Those boys don't play. Those bloods, they see people doing pedestrian nomadism, they pick them up. I've seen it happen. So it also depends on the certain local areas. It depends how serious they are about going after people who are on foot. And by the way, they weren't going after encampments. They were going after people who were just kind of lollygagging on a sidewalk, right? It's loitering is what they were going after. Now, obviously, if you're doing a pedestrian nomadism thing, presumably you're moving at some point, but even people that are moving, let's say, let's say you're walking for three hours a day instead of driving, right? At some point, you do have to stop and drink water and take a nap and all that, and, of course, set up your shelter and so forth. Uh, depending where you do that and so forth, you might be having a visit from the bludge. 
Other times mm-hmm. you won't see the bludge ever. So the, it, that also depends too, is where you're at as well. But I would say on the whole, cops are looking for the revenue generation, and they're not going to get that from pedestrians. They're going to get that from drivers. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, so I guess the, the last caveat I'll add for Vandom, as you mentioned, and it's kind of in contrast, I guess it could be in contrast with pedestrian nomadism, but um, I guess I, when I think about pedestrian nomadism, I think at least to some extent, like, uh, uh, what, what's their names? Uh, the, Dwelling Portably is a, a publication that came out in the 70s and is, was still around in like 2018 or 2019. Um, but they, they basically, yeah, they were for, for, you know, decades, um, they were, um, wilderness campers, um, pedestrian nomads just, you know, traveling through the mountains and I guess the mountains out West and I guess they did some out East or whatever, but, um, wherever. Um, but, um, with, with that sort of pedestrian nomadism, I figure you, I, I figure you'd just be more mobile anyway, like, or, like for, for the most part, cause you aren't going to have any permanent shelter. You might just move a small, a small distance every day or something. Um, but with van nomadism, the only, I feel like the, the only way to be practical in the, in the States would be like if you actually don't travel much. Like if you're pretty much self-contained, you can stay out for like a month at a time without needing anything. Like out in the middle of nowhere, out west or something, um, where it's, where no one's going to come. Um, it might be, you know, fandom as it might be feasible then. But um, again, there's not that many people that can be self-contained for that long. To I mean, to make it, I guess, worthwhile MTH wise, at least when discussing some of these other things. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I suppose I uh, um, so we got yeah about 40 minutes in. Um, next one, living on a sailboat. Um, so this one's obviously still, um, yeah, still, uh, I guess a longer term goal, um, you know, for experience, even just like a, you know, short experience, whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, there have been a couple of other ones over the past couple of years who have expressed interest and, in, um, you know, that they're looking for, they're, they're in the process of building a, um, you know, like a minimalist boating community, um, you know, where they, whatever, I don't know what their, their goals are, but there are people that are interested in that are, that are coordinating, um, and, um, you know, I think like in, in terms of, uh, the, I guess the, 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 you know, the anarchy of international waters, um, no, like if you can, if you, if you can, um, yeah, if you can, you know, be pretty self-sufficient and, you know, you got sailboat and you aren't reliant always on gas uh, or on fuel. Um, no, I, th- I think it, it, it can, it's, it's definitely, um, a lot more radical. Um, everyone knows how to drive a car not everyone knows how to, you know, sail a boat, um, and obviously there are some other, um, you know, other dangers and skills and knowledge that need to be known to be able to do it. So there's, le- there's a learning curve there. Um, but otherwise, I mean, there are people that have done this, um, just average, you know, normal people who have done this, live this lifestyle for a long time. Um, and you know, once you learn those things, it's, it's, it's relatively safe, just like yeah, uh, most other things. Um, but, uh, and then actually there, there will, I just, just, just saw the email, um, a little, uh, like an hour ago come through. Um, I will be interviewing, um, on, uh, the podcast end of the month sometime, a, a guy who's been living on his sailboats, um, for quite some time. So, um, he lives over in Europe and, uh, uh connection through, through somebody else, but that, uh, that'll be, uh, yeah, that'll be fun. I guess we'll, we'll probably cover this, this lifestyle, um, much more in depth there from someone who's done it for a while. But, uh, otherwise, what else, what else would there be? There, yeah, there, there's a small application, the individual application, which is kind of more what I'm referring to here than there's the more large scale one, um, like floating hotels and, uh, decommissioned aircraft carriers and things like that, which again, we'll leave that for the, for the end. But, um, as far as an individual or family thing, or, you know, small intentional community, I think there are a lot of advantages to, um, yeah, the sailboat thing. Um, and just to, to mention, uh, John, who, who talked about this on a PASNI assembly, so it's public. Um, but there are other in- interesting and unique, uh, unique opportunities out there on the ocean, um, so he, uh, yeah, he, so his, I guess his long-term goal is to, or maybe even midterm goal is to get out on the ocean and, uh, um, yeah, basically generate, generate breakthrough or breakthrough free or, uh, I guess generate free energy from the ocean making monoatomics. Um, so, and, and monoatomics, um, are extremely, extremely beneficial for health, um, reversing, um, and I guess yeah, reversing, you know, so-called diseases that, shouldn't be able to be reversed according to Babylon pharmaceuticals. But, um, so yeah, that's, uh, you know, like there, there's, there's a lot of, uh, and, 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 and now Kyle, we've got a lot, we've got a lot to talk about, um, on a lot of things. Um, and especially if you're at, you know, if you're at here for Bonny Fest, um, in September, that'd be, a, you know, the best, app, best route for some of these. Cause there, there's a lot of these topics I, I'm not going to talk about publicly, at least until they're, um, you know, here, sure. but, um, but yeah, there's, so yeah, I guess that's, that's another just really amazing opportunity on the, on the open ocean. Um, and, uh, then, yeah, if you've got, if you've got, uh, you know, the monoatomics, you could have, you know, um, 
yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. My mind's, my mind's rest, uh, racing out, but, um, yeah, Kyle, what are your thoughts living on a sailboat? Um, you know, the past five years or so, what do you think it's more viable, less viable advantages, disadvantages? What are your, what are your thoughts? Same viability, if not more so. And I think this is something I want to explore more just on my own. Um, mainly because if you think about to bring in fiction for a moment, if you think about certain action movies or buddy cop movies or police procedurals and all that, at some point it's either usually the cop character or a suspect or some sort of major character that's always living in a boat that's docked in whatever major city it is, whether it's Los Angeles or New York or, or well, okay, maybe not New York, but, but Los Angeles or some, you know, shiny happy place. Um, here in Texas it would most likely be Houston because uh, that's a port city. Well, it's Corpus Christi and, and kind of that area where it's like all where it's humid as all hell. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, being uh, you know, there's the old phrase about you know setting sail for sunnier waters and all that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if we're talking again, going back to any time of harassment, like how many in terms of the bludge, how many bludge are on the waters versus on the roads? Last time I checked. There's more so-called law enforcement on the fucking roads than there are on the high seas. If we're talking strictly exactly. about numbers. Yeah, if you're if you're you so, know, 20 like, miles off the coast, you're not going to see a goddamn U.S. Coast Guard. Um, not unless they're called see, for something. It, yeah, but yeah, 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 exactly. There's 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 no enforcement. It's worse than that. Let's say you are within that 20 miles. How many of the bludge, just strictly in terms of numbers, that are doing their patrols and trying to justify their own salaries and all that? How many of them are there relative to all the various land pirates? You no, see what no, I mean? No, no, so I at that point, yeah. we're just talking about everything. So if we were just to throw, throw random numbers as his estimates, if there were 100,000 total you know, land bludge of all the different agencies and municipalities and sheriff's departments, or sheriff's offices and so forth, versus your Coast Guard and whomever else would be Maybe some sort of parks and rec type cops, right? Because there are the state park, uh, state uh, Texas State Park Police guys. Um, I don't know if they have an aquatics unit specifically, but something like that, right? Um, how many of those guys are going to be in boat, presumably in boats, going up and down the again the 20 miles of your coastline, or even like up in uh, the fucking uh, Michigan area, right, with the five uh, you know the Great Lakes, right? How many cops would even be in that area? Because that's all domestic anyway. Uh, at least, uh, at least, uh, at least until you start talking about the border with Canada. So again, it's like how how many bloods are going to be on the water? Right. And so yeah. if you have hypothetically hundred thousand total bloods on land, your water is going to be like what? Maybe five thousand in in relative terms. Maybe that. Maybe like a lot less than that. So if we're talking strictly in terms of numbers, and the probability of saying. It's getting boarded. I mean, it's, it's the equivalent of a traffic stop. A way through, they flash lights on, and they have the loudspeaker thing, and, you know, you're about to be bored. You know, we're such and such police, and you're about, you know, turn off your engine. You're about to be boarded. Um, I think there's been a couple do- uh, doc- uh, docu-series I've seen where they show the Coast Guard, like, bordering a fishing vessel oh, yeah. because they suspect I'm a smart guy or something, right? But it's like, how frequent is that kind of thing? So I mean, that's, that's, that's a, no, you're, you're, you're exactly right. Um, that, you know, out on the open ocean, you're not going to come across the enforcement. I think, and now, now I'm thinking about it, the only real coercion you run into or the only time your mean time harassment is severely, severely decreased is when you have to go into a port, you know, port of entry. Um, right. because, uh, you know, I was watching, you know, one of those, they're just, uh, you know, what they're a sailboating family and, you know, the status, but they were, you know, showing the process of, you know, checking in at port of entry. And, uh, yeah, it's not just like, uh, if you fly to Mexico, you gotta, they gotta make sure like you've got a passport and all that, or, you know, vice versa, fly to or from Mexico, you make sure you have your passport. But if you're on a sailboat, you gotta check in with like five different government agencies, like local government agencies. Um, say so when you get your, right. your identity, they want to make sure you're not bringing in, you know, exotic species. They want to make sure that et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it was a pain in the ass, like this small Island town. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's really the, the time. Um, but again, if you can be self-sufficient and, you know, create, um, you know, create your life on like an, on an un- uninhabited ocean island or something like that, um, and not have to go back up, but like two or three times a year, 
if you got a, you know, family and you can go back and get, you know, your, um, you can get your, you know, pallets of rice or whatever the hell you need to get, you know, export, you know, back to your, um, back to your, your Vanu shelter, shelter shelters. Um, I mean, it, it could totally be feasible, but it's, it's really when you go into those port of entries, um, where it could, it could be extreme, extremely hellish. Or if you're, if you're in the know, which I'm excited to talk to this guy, uh, Martin, um, over from uh, Europe somewhere. I'm excited to talk to him and get his thought, you know, get his experiences on entering port of entries. And if there's, you know, if obviously it's inside knowledge um, that you'd have to know from experience or from someone who's had the experience, um, you know, what ones aren't as tyrannical and, you know, what ones we could you slide in and slide out without even, you know, giving an ID or something. Maybe those exist. Maybe they don't. I, I don't know. I'll have to find out. Yeah. Yeah. There, there is that. Um, I mean, I mean, here's the thing, too. So, going across international lines is also not the same as just commuting down the road to either your place of work or the grocery store or whatever, right? It's not exactly the same. Um, getting pulled over by the bludge in a car is not the same thing as crossing the international border and or going into a, a port of entry, right? For two reasons. One, the traffic stop is coercive. You will pull over or else they'll start, you know, you, you know, hitting the car, shooting, and all that kind of stuff, right? The use of force gets escalated. And deadly force, of course, on the table because there's cars mm-hmm. involved. And cars can be used as weapons. Um, yeah, one versus, one one versus a thousand. Be, yeah, you're going to lose. Something like that. Or at least, there, or at least, let me put it this way, or at least the, 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 the deck is stacked against you, the suspect. Let's put it that way. I, I'll leave it at that. Sometimes I do get away, by the way. But it's definitely stacked. Um, the second thing is port of entry, international border. That is something you can prepare for. Traffic stops, by their nature, are a surprise. True, it's happening. Point. Whoop whoop! You could you You're could ro- you could role play your port of entry interrogations like days before, like and be completely sure. ready and yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you can prepare sure. for that. Of course. Yeah, do, do what that's a proxy the, uh, merchant yeah. service, actually. Yeah, I mean that's a proxy merchant service, and that someone can make a lot of money off of that. Yeah, that could be their life. Yeah. Hey, don't joke. I might just do that. But um, exactly, it's a very good observation you made. Um, where even preparing people with the role play police interrogations would itself be a proxy merchant service. Actually, that's actually kind of a topic itself we should explore in a different episode. But. But regarding like the difference of a traffic stop versus port of entry, international slash international crossing, um, you know, it, it, it's the question of who is the initiating actor. So with your traffic stop, it's your blood, right? Because again, to reiterate, a whoop whoop. This is the such and such police department. Pull over. Come out with your hands up. You know all that kind of shit, right? It doesn't have to be necessarily to that extent, but you get the idea, right? They're initiating the. They're the ones making contact. Mm-hmm. Okay, they're coming to you. Okay, you're doing your thing. You're whatever, moving around, and maybe you took a curve too fast. Whatever it is, right? Or maybe you did cut somebody off, right? And they're like, whoop, whoop. You are pulling over now, or else things get very exciting very quickly. Versus, well, I could go, you know, into Los Angeles, or I could go into uh, Vancouver, or I could go into whatever, but I have to cross the border first. You know what, I think I'm just going to, you know, I think I'll do it tomorrow, right? I, you know, you're the initiating actor you know, with a port of entry slash international crossing. You make the decision, right? The border is the border is the border that the status have arbitrarily drawn on a map, right? You, the, generally speaking, the status are not going to force you to cross the border. Again, I'm just speaking very generally here. I, I guess there's always exceptions. I'm not getting into that. Just generally speaking, normal daily life. Status, the bludge, are not going to force you to cross the border. They're not going to force you to go into a port of entry. You're going to make a choice. You're the initiating actor. You're the one who's choosing to make contact with them because you're trying to get on the other side of that line. So that right there, the dynamic is completely different because of who the initiating actor is, of who made contact with whom first and why. So because you're initiating contact, that means you have, at the risk of invoking Batman here, you've got prep time. 
You do. Yeah, you you can you can it's dump the, you can dump the exotic species off at the island before you go back to port. We'll just leave it at that. Sure. <laughs> sure. If sure, if that's what you're into, yeah, of course. Um, you know, uh, versus the other thing where you're in the shit, the incident is happening. There is no prep time, and now you got to hop step, jump, and what you do you, in the next you've, couple. You've got the exotic seconds. species in your car. Yeah, then you're fucked. Yeah. Or at the very least, you're me. You're at the very least. Uh, mean time of harassment just went, you know, it's very, very short. And you've got, and again, you're, you're down to, you're down to seconds and minutes, or excuse me, you're down to minutes and seconds. And depending what you do in the next couple of minutes and seconds is with depend, depending whether you still have your freedom or not. Sometimes even your life, depending what's going on specifically. Um, but the, and there's no prep time with crossing a border. You have prep time and that gives you an advantage, whether it's, Role playing ahead of time, or getting your papers in order, or even if you were to go on a paper trip, which itself is its own topic for another time. Even if you were to go on a paper trip, you can, with prep time, you can put together that alternate ID set of IDs and all that, and at least have half a decent chance in hell of passing through successfully without them accusing you of identity theft or the other lame excuses they're not coming up with. Um, so that's that's kind of where I'm getting at, is if there was any one advantage that sailboating, that minimal sailboating would have over van nomadism, it's that dynamic right there about who makes contact with whom, who is the initiating actor. And the fact that you've got prep time with the one versus the other is an automatic increase in MTH by far. And, that and it, fact, it can be a actually, specialized proxy merchant role. So no one has to be an expert. Sure, sure. Yeah. It's, it's even, actually, if you think about it, Shane, it's actually better than that because the traffic stop is itself a form of harassment, whereas if you're going to the port of entry, you're actually going to the state. So does it really count as harassment in some sense because you're choosing to go to them for something because you're trying to get something out of the state mm-hmm. or at least slip through them somehow? But you're still making decisions, right? There, there, there's still a limited degree of voluntarism, sort of. A voluntarism, where at least you're choosing the timing. You're right? voluntarily, the yeah. You're voluntarily choosing to work with the coercers, yeah. The, uh, the wording is weird. No. <laughs> yeah. But again, I would say the timing is what's voluntary, right? Because of their laws and because if they control the land and all, that's the coercive part of it, right? That's the violation of the non-aggression principle and so forth. Okay, so for all for all the nap uh, uh, fundamentalists and all that, it's not that you guys are bad. I mean, we're the same way. It's more just that the timing is the only part that's voluntary here. You're choosing to go to the bludge, shall we say, early in the morning rather than late at night, right? With traffic stops don't work like that. They are fully coercive from start to finish. You don't, basically, you don't get a choice. They made the choice for you when they go, whoop, whoop, and the lights go on. The, when you go to a port of entry, there is no whoop, whoop equivalent. There just isn't. You're just waltzing in (laughs) To the office, you're waltzing through a checkpoint, you're waltzing through whatever the uh, the liminal space is that they control coercively, yes, but you're choosing to go into that, the timing of it anyway, because you're either trying to pass through or get their permission or, uh, shall we say, smuggle through even something. Um, smuggle the exotic species, is, yeah, right. Sure, sure. So that prep time and the, the, prep, the prep time in general, as well as the timing of when you go to them, are incredibly important, not just for ethical uh, purposes, but also as a more practical thing. Uh, because that actually means you have a greater invulnerability to coercion by virtue of that prep time, by virtue of you can choose when to go. Automatically, that's a higher MTH. Before we even talk about anything else, Right. The role-playing interrogations and the nature of your allegedly endangered species and so forth, right? We're not, even before getting into all of that, the MTH is automatically higher. So if there was any positive thing to be said for sale, but minimalist sailboating, it's that right there. In some ways, we don't even need to talk about the boat. Even if you were, uh, shall we say, even driving through, uh, you know, from, from domestic uh, United States to Canada and so forth, you're automatically at an advantage. I mean, hell, even going to friggin' Mexico, even 
to some degree, right? Exactly. You got a boat. You can head to Canada. You can head to Mexico. Yeah, you've got you've got a lot of like, and and you don't necessarily have to even go. You don't have to go across a border necessarily, um, like a border checkpoint. Again, port of entry, but you don't have to go across. You don't have to. There's no like. uh, There's they don't have like the great sea of like the the great sea of uh, of China out there. Um, you know, extending out into the ocean across like the Mexico U.S. border that doesn't exist. So like, you can drive your boat like, across there. Like, there's no, there's no wall. Right. You know. So, um, no, I'm with you. There, there, there's definitely advantages. Um, but to to keep to to keep to in respect, I know um, you've got yeah, you've got stuff going on today, and um, we've yeah. well, you've got wait, stuff going on later today. I guess a better way to put that. Um, so I guess we'll do, we'll do this in two parts. Um, next week we'll we'll finish this out, and maybe the passing itself work, and maybe it won't. But, um. I'll go, you know, I'll, I'll go through and listen to this again, and you know, go through post production. I, I won't release it this week. I'll probably early, I'll I'll probably release it all at once. But um, yeah, next time we'll talk about uh, maybe next Sunday. Who knows? We'll see. Um, Vanu and cities uh, will be one one topic. Again, that's going to take probably half hour on its own time um, to go through all that, all those nuances and such. Underground shelters and troglodytism um, that will take some time too. Uh, more theoretical, but after doing so much uh, digitizing of. Uh, Vani life and preform and form nomads. Um, there are, you know, I'm I'm becoming kind of more interested in kind of the underground sort of thing, especially like the the disadvantages back in the 70s. <laughs> um, you know, technology's advanced, um, things have advanced a little bit since then. Thank goodness. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's more applicable now. Um, anyway, then the last thing um, for the Vani shelters is radical housing. Um, again, decommissioned aircraft carriers, floatels, floating hotels like the Marinia project. Um, the now defunct Marinier Project, you know, may it, may it rest in peace. Um, and then uh, airship homes and communities, something which we have not t- talked about that, Kyle, but I, that would be a very interesting, um, interesting thing. Something that we're we're curious about here at Pasnia or here at Veritas. Um, and then yeah, transitioning over to Pasnia being um, a new model. So, you know, from from all that we've talked about over the years, combining that into because um, a lot of times, Kyle, you said you can have, you can have your cake, but you can't eat it too. I'm um, trying to make it where you can have both, where you can you can have a network of self-sufficient homesteads. For ac- it's, it's a second home network, a parallel network, where you can you can have some semi permanence, but also um, have the mobility, which truly does provide um, a lot of the immobility, or I guess the invulnerability to coercion. So, um, yeah. Anyway, lots so much so much great to talk about. It's it's great to have you back, Kyle. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess anything else before before we we close this out. Well, Shaq, depending how the next part goes, we might have to turn it into a three-part, although we won't try not to, but... Who the hell knows, right? <laughs> yeah, but seriously, guys, I mean, this is something where you have to really think about, is, again, go back to mean time to harassment. Whatever form of your, uh, that your venuum takes, you've got to be thinking in terms of MTH. So just very briefly before we close out here, kind of a preview of things to come, and also kind of, kind of going over MTH in terms of uh, examples. Um, with even more developed version of the new ones, like um, like your tiny homes, um, or some sort of shack out in the woods, or even going more so than that, where you start getting into, um, shall we say, a uh, free port or something similar, uh, or your intentional community, which would actually be the step right behind the evolutionary step right behind that, um, or even going again, going a step further some form of light industry to heavy industry, which is the really challenging stuff. Um, whether it's your underground city kind of thing, uh, literally underground or, or something else, uh, your, your very, very well-developed missile silo bunker thing. Uh, some of them have been decommissioned and are for sale and all that. You could basically, that's essentially a small town. Um, you know, those, uh, the, the type of harassment, those, or excuse me, the, the, the longer, I'm not necessarily going to say that the more developed of the new one is, therefore, it has automatically has a um, longer MTH. In some cases, that's not true. In fact, actually, the Bloods themselves actually really do like their uh, missile silos and other things too, right? Because even they recognize the value of such things um, in terms of protecting themselves, whether from each other, or from the population that they imagine themselves to be ruling over and, and so forth. So uh, sometimes they kind of act like us in some ways. Is there in some ways they're trying to lower their own mean time to harassment in a manner of speaking, because you know they're they're trying to keep themselves alive, right? While at the same time they're trying to decimate their own enemies and all that. So if you think about like um, 
the, the stereotyped imagery of one set of statists with nuclear weapons hiding in a bunker versus another set of statists also hiding in a bunker with nuclear weapons. Uh, technically, uh, maybe that could be considered a version of light industry, if not maybe heavy industry. But again, it's like they're, they're trying to protect themselves to some degree, right? Okay, take the nuclear weapon part of it out, out for a second. Um, they're still hiding in, in some, as they would view it, right? Um, they're not exactly doing a lot of import-export. Uh, with us, it would be something more along those lines where, yes, we, there would be the, you know, James, the stereotype James Bond underground villain base thing, but there would be a lot of import-export. And in some of those movies, you can see a lot of, like, the background extras, like, moving things around and all that. And it's like, yeah, that's kind of what we're doing, except we're not villains. We're not a James Bond villain. Right. It would just be kind of almost like a hippie commune type thing where everyone, well, that's also combined almost with a factory almost uh, in some ways. And, you know, depending how it works and especially if how the import export is done with the light industry, heavy industry of the new um, the place could essentially become like a hidden city, a real yeah. one. And that would be exciting if we could, if I could try and help make that happen before I'm six feet under. I would love to do that. That would be a that would be a, a crowning achievement. I would say. Yeah. Whether yeah whether whether it's uh, a more sea setting sort of thing, which again, um, what we got coming up with the I guess the more radical bigger bigger scale solutions, which, um, which Rayo backed away from obviously, or I guess uh, um, Tom Marshall backed away from, and then Rayo backed away from even you know secondhand. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so like the, I, I mentioned this before, but the free out free aisles literature is forthcoming and we're talking about the, um, you know, whether it's a, a you know, whether it's a, a, a free port or whatever. Um, yeah, like there, there's a lot of valuable stuff there. That'll, that'll probably come, um, before we record the second one, that'll, that'll probably come out in the past in the next week. Um, again, way too much government, government shit and too complicated because they were, they were trying to implement, you know, the quote unquote voluntary government Ayn Rand thing. Um, you can't ever, I never stop hearing about fucking Ayn Rand in those sixties or seventies publications. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, th there's, there, there, there's some, rec there's some rec replicable things. Um, so, um, yeah, anyway, more bigger and more radical solutions. Um, I mean, we're talking about meantime to harassment, the skill and competence required is just ridiculous. And the, in just the, in the initial investment capital is retarded unless you're lucky enough to be one of those so-called private corporations that gets an, an old decommissioned aircraft carrier for a dollar, for, uh, just a dollar. You pay a go government for a dollar for it and they basically sell it for scrap. And it's like motherfuckers. Like we got it. It'd be good to have a connection like that someday. Um, we need a dollar, an aircraft commission, uh, decommissioned aircraft carrier for a dollar. <laughs> um, but I don't know. Big dreams. Um, so yeah, next, next, next time we talk, Kyle, I think we'll, yeah, we'll just continue on where we started Vonnie and cities, more radical housing, as I mentioned, and, and maybe get into Pasney a little bit, but, um, yeah, don't want to keep it too much longer, man. I, I know there's, uh, there's, there's always endless things to do and I know you got, you got, uh, you got those to do. Um, but, uh, yeah, I guess I'm looking forward to next week. Looking forward to uh, um, all that's to come, and hopefully, again, you know, mention, mention it um, to you to remind you, and also just for to remind the listeners too about Vonnie Fest Five coming up September 30th, October 7th, here at the Veritas Note at the Free Republic. Um, it's going to be a really incredible event. I'm not going to tell you shit about it here publicly, um, so you just got to come to sure. find out. <laughs> um, well, not necessarily, Kyle. I'll tell you about it in private conversations, but for general, for general folks, um, you just got to come to the, you got to come out to the second realm to see it and experience it. Because obviously it's not wise to talk about these things digitally in a lot of a lot of senses. Of but, course. Yeah. Um, anyway, brother, fantastic um, as always. Looking forward to next week. And uh, as for the uh, as for the listeners, um, yeah, VonniePodcast dot com is the place to go for all things Vonni. Uh, for our, find our entire podcast archives, free Vonni books, articles, audiobooks, and much more. Uh, check out LibertyAttack dot com for books, bundles, audiobooks, health and wellness tools like the Pain Liberator, uh, privacy tools, ghost pads and ghost phones, and like nine other products coming very soon uh and much more uh and please do consider checking out the free book of paznia uh p-a-z-n-i-a paznia.com uh and we do hope you'll get involved uh, in one fashion or in one fashion or another and uh finally if you have any topic suggestions or questions for a up, an upcoming q a feel free to get them over uh it has been a while email us shane at uh, or dm wherever is convenient uh, thanks so much for your time today uh, until next time cheers from the veritas node of the free republic of paznia Hello friends, fellow self-liberators. Dr. Gatherer here coming to you with a health and wellness message. The Pain Liberator 
Miracle Muscle Pain Reliever is now back in stock at libertyunderattack.com. For your basic aches and pains, to more extensive injuries, and even pains like headaches or migraines, the Pain Liberator is here to liberate you from discomfort. The Pain Liberator is a 20% DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide, slash 80% colloidal silver water base, blended with enough aspirin to provide 30 milligrams of aspirin per spray. Beyond just pain relief, all three of these main ingredients provide enormous benefit to the body in general. DMSO also helps to bring the aspirin and colloidal silver into the skin for maximum bioavailability. Individual benefits include colloidal silver is antibacterial, antifungal, used for sore throats, sinus problems, tooth infections, and candida overgrowths. DMSO has over 40 known pharmacological properties, helps with acne, heals shingles, is radio slash EMF protective, painkiller, and heals stroke and heart attack damage. Aspirin is one of the safest, cheapest miracle drugs in existence. Searching PubMed, it assists with basically every disease or imbalance, from muscle pain, to reversing cancerous tumors and everything in between. Spray directly on head for headaches. The Pain Liberator is available via Liberty Under Attack publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com slash pain to place your order today. PayPal, Bitcoin, and Monero accepted. For Monero, email shane at libertyunderattack.com. The Pain Liberator, Miracle Muscle Pain Reliever a PASNIA Department of Health and Wellness Creation. Liberty under attack at com slash pain. All right, hey guys, Shane Rio2 here from the Vani Podcast, uh, providing a uh, an update on the homestead, uh, which I've been asked about many times, uh, but hardly ever fulfill, um, mostly because you know the work's being done. But this is one of those cases where proof of work might be a good thing, and just to show you what what the f is going on here uh, and what we're doing. So um, basically, here I'm just gonna uh, you know play this video and, and kind of narrate, um, and uh, that will be the gist of this. Um, all right, so we're starting out here. This is the uh, the big shed um, where you know we'll have uh, you know female lambs, female goats, things like that. And specific nutrition, they'll they'll be routed in there. But this is the expanded fence, um, I guess, going down the line here uh, towards the the dam of the pond, uh, which we'll see momentarily. But uh, in essence, we're trying to give them more more areas to graze as we we expand. Uh, but yeah, uh, right now you're seeing there'll be a small, you know, grass, uh, there'll be fences along the side of where that, that rock ends. Um, but yeah, to, to uh, you know, wear down their hooves, um, which is necessary if you have lambs and, and goats. Um, and then, uh, yeah, also to help with washing, because just shit, you know, as they, you know, you got 20 lambs or something, tromp, you know, tromping through somewhere and shit gets a little muddy. Um, it's uh, muddy real quick. Uh, but yeah, really at this point, we went, we went down the dam and now we're going towards these corner posts. Um, we're doing this kind of in stages. Um, those are the, the, the corner posts of, I guess, the first stage of fencing. Um, there's another one off to the right and then uh, coming up on the right in the view now. Um, and then we're heading back towards um, towards where we came from and we're going to jump momentarily to a pond view from the opposite side so you can see uh, kind of what we're looking at here. Right, right there along the dam is where that, that fencing is. And playing it again because it was a short B-roll clip. I should have done one longer, but anyway, now we're heading back down. Um, so we got to keep the the lambs and the goats, you know, far enough off the dam where they don't wash, so it doesn't wash. Because um, having a leaky dam is no good. Um, so yeah, th this is basically just uh, you know where where the rhino is driving down now is essentially where you know they'll they'll go out to pasture uh, is kind of the point. And yeah, like I said, there's going to be st we're doing the stage one right now, which is about halfway through that first field. Um, and then, uh, yeah, in the fall, hopefully we'll finish off, um, you know, that fencing, but, um, holy shit, <laughs> when you try to fence off, you know, this amount of, you know, area and do it, you know, correctly, um, to make it like a 50 year forever fence, um, yeah, shit gets expensive. So it's gotta be done in stages. 
Um, but thankfully, we've been, you know, all of our, pretty much any time you come out to Pasnia and you buy anything here, for the most part, that just goes into the Pasnia fund for, for improvements on the project. And um, thankfully, a lot of that, a lot of those funds have, you know, gone towards towards that. Um, but there's the proof of work. Um, I don't want to ramble and, and make this, you know, super, super long. But, um, yeah, really, that's that's the, the biggest thing is, you know, we're the, the biggest couple points of self-sufficiency now are, I guess, you know, we're, we're focusing on, obviously, the gardens every spring. But um, the bigger projects are, you know, the pond and getting all this fencing, um, all the fencing done. So we can give them more pasture. And, and yeah, obviously, the end goal, uh, you know, putting all this money into fencing and things is, um, yeah, it'd be great to have, you know, like a, you know, a set of 50 lamps a year or something. Um, maybe a couple of sets of lambs a year, um, where, you know, you take uh, 50 of them to au live auction, um, and you obviously don't get as much as, as you would if you just process them and did all that yourself, but, um, you can just, you know, live without having to process them or anything and just get, you know, two, $2 or two fifty a pound. Um, it's like shit. Yeah. Especially if it can be totally free and they're just on pasture essentially. So, um, anyway, that's, that's what's happening here. I'm wishing you all a uh, joyous and liberated day wherever you are. Pasnia.com is uh, to get the place to go for all things of free republic. And if you want to join the second realm, uh, vaniapodcast.com for all things Vani and, and conversations on self-liberation. And then uh, if you want to, uh, you know, go find the material uh, that will help you uh, on your path to liberation, libertarianattack.com is the place to go for that. Uh, you can find books, uh, audiobooks, um, strategy guides, all sorts of stuff in, in that area, you know, the, the knowledge necessary for, for, for self-liberation. Um, and then, uh, yeah, beyond that, even some, some tools, uh, health and wellness tools like uh, the Pain Liberator, uh, Miracle Pain Reliever Solution. That's uh, my, my first actual wellness, I guess, uh, product, so to speak. Um, or as pot care items are on there, and uh, we've got some Pasnia Farms canned goods uh, from, you know, last year, and uh, there'll be plenty more this year, so... Um, anyway, thanks so much for your time today, guys. I uh, hope you enjoyed this uh, this short update from the homestead. And uh, yeah, until next time. Cheers. <laughs>